20 winters ago, college basketball fans in Oklahoma and beyond were captivated by a phenomenon. The Oklahoma State men's basketball team was all the rage. Coached by Eddie Sutton and powered by an unlikely band of players, the Cowboys turned game days into an event. Gallagher Iba Arena was packed and the players were rock stars. Among them, Daniel Bobbick, a sharpshooter who had transferred from BYU, was already married, was already a dad and was an important part of OSU's 2004 Final Four team. We'll talk to Daniel and his wife, Natalie, who became part of the Cowboy Phenomenon too. But first, I want to say a word of thanks to these sponsors for supporting The Jenny Carlson Show. Oklahoma Ford Dealers, Two Fellows Movers, Mid First Bank, The National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, FireLakeJobs.com, Next Gen Roofing, 988, Oklahoma's Mental Health Lifeline. Remember, drive into your best in Oklahoma Ford dealers today for the best deals on Ford's full lineup of trucks and SUVs. Ford is the best in Oklahoma. And hey, if you're thinking about moving, let's face it, a box of pizza and a case of beer just don't work like they used to. Nobody wants to help you move. We know two fellas that love moving. At Two Fellas Moving Company, we offer free, no strings quotes for your move. With over 20 years experience, we've pretty much moved it all. Our services don't end up moving either. Need to do some remodeling or spring cleaning? We have you covered with dumpster rentals and junk haul services. Remember, quotes are free and there are no strings attached. So if you're moving in Oklahoma, make sure to call the fellas. Visit twofellas.com for your free quote today. All right, Daniel, Natalie, thank you so much for joining me. I cannot believe we're talking about 20 years since that Final Four team. Is that unbelievable or what? Yeah, it's pretty hard to believe. I mean, honestly, it is really, really hard to believe. But yeah, my gray hair <laughs> can attest. Yes, it's been 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think it's also worth pointing out, Natalie, you just dropped off that uh, that bouncing baby boy you guys brought to Stillwater. You just dropped him off in Stillwater. That sort of puts everything in perspective, right? Well, uh, that was just so surreal and so fun and I still kind of get a little emotional when I think about it because it was unexpected but the best place for him and we're so excited for him and yeah he was six weeks old yeah well I had my six-week appointment in Utah Daniel was already gone and then I got in a car with my mom and we drove to Oklahoma so he was six weeks old when we got to Stillwater. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And we'll talk about him in a sec. We want to talk more about Jackson, the rest of the kids, life now. But we got to rewind to that 2004 Final Four season. Before we dive into that, uh, Natalie, you mentioned this. But, Daniel, let's rewind a little more on your decision to transfer because it's the summer of 2002. You guys are already married, already have your son, but you're at BYU and you decide to do something different. Walk me through just what happened there to get you to Stillwater. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Um, so I served a mission for my church right out of high school and I come back and a lot of kids that I played with and against in high school, Gilbert Arenas, Tayshawn Prince, Baron Davis, those types of guys, you know, went on and had good high school or good college careers and they were in the NBA. And I thought to myself, well, shoot. If those guys can do it, so can I. And so after being at BYU for a couple of years, just wasn't didn't feel like I had developed as much of a basketball player as I would have liked. And and um, obviously was comfortable there. I mean, it's a great school. My in-laws live there. I have some family that live there. And, uh, you know, we play some games in Southern California where I'm from in Vegas and places that are easy for my parents to get get to. And um, just decided I wanted to play in the NBA and I, and I wanted to be develop my full potential as a basketball player. And so I. I um I went and got released from my scholarship, which was an amazing. That was a really good day. <laughs> yeah, you can go imagine and go talk to your, you know, you bring it, you know, talk to your wife. We'd had these conversations, right? And it was like we basically just didn't see eye to eye, I guess, if you will, <laughs> on staying versus going. And and so I walked into the athletic director because back in the day you actually had to go and have a conversation with the athletic director and let them know that hey, I want need to get released from my scholarship so that I can pursue other opportunities. And so. I walk in and of course, you know, you can't talk to anybody before that happens. So I go in and get released from my scholarship and then I go home and tell Natalie, who's, you know, seven or eight months pregnant saying, Hey, we're leaving. And she's like, where are you going? And I said, honestly, I, I don't know. 
you know, and that didn't go over very well. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't. She like, we're living like this one bedroom. <laughs> base, we're living like in this one bedroom basement apartment. And she like goes into the room and like, and like is bawling her eyes out. And like, I just remember sitting in this little couch that we had in the front room and just thinking to myself, all right, man, you got to make this work. You got to make this happen. And, and honestly, you know, I got down on my knees and I was like, you know, Heavenly Father, I need help figuring out what am I get, what am I doing? I just feel like this is the right thing to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Obviously, this this decision impacts other people, and so I need to figure this out. And so, um, you know, Oklahoma State recruited me a little bit when I was in high school. My dad obviously played for Coach Sutton back in the '70s, so my dad played for Coach uh, at Creighton. Um, and you know, my dad made a couple phone calls, and Coach was like, "Can he still shoot?" <laughs> you know, and and uh, and they said, "Well, you know, bring him out." And so we. Uh, we, we went out there and, and um, you know, I was looking at maybe getting closer to family. You know, I really wanted to go to UCLA coming out of high school, um, you know, and was thinking that maybe I'd go back to Southern California, but it just didn't feel like the right fit. And after, you know, we got in our little Honda and drove the 1,100 miles from Salt Lake to, to Stillwater and met with Sean and Coach and Coach Dickey had just got on staff and everybody just wrapped their arms around us. And, you know, we, we honestly felt like it was like it was home. You know, we felt like it was the right where we needed to be. And I didn't have a scholarship. Like, like, listen, Hey, listen, we don't have a scholarship for you. So here's what's crazy, Jenny. I leave a scholarship on the table. Obviously, you know, I'm at, I'm at BYU. I have family there. It's a good school, um, really good situation, have a scholarship. And then I go ahead and I get released from my scholarship, not know where I'm going. Then I don't have a scholarship. I have a baby that's six weeks old. I'm learning how to be a, you know, a, a husband, a dad, a college student, a basketball player. Like all this stuff was, well, it was just really was, it was hard, right? It was really, really hard. And um, I remember, you know, I didn't have good enough grades. I had good grades, but not good enough to get, um, to get the out-of-state tuition waived. And so essentially, like I had to pay out-of-state tuition. Ironically enough, I still have like $600 that I owe from that year <laughs> that I'm still like, you know, paying off, just hanging on to it because it's like, I don't want to pay it off because it still reminds me of the sacrifice that we, that we made to be able to make that work, you know? <laughs> and so, so it was great. I mean, honestly, I feel like we need to talk to Chad Weiberg today and get that wiped away. That needs to be gone. That's right. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's a little bit of a pride thing for me because I'm grateful that it's like, it's the price that I paid for what I wanted most. Right. And, and I think that anything you want in this world requires some kind of sacrifice and requires work. And, and that's to, quite honestly why she still gets emotional or I get emotional talking about Oklahoma State and our experiences there because it was hard, right? Initially at the beginning, it was super, super hard. We didn't know yeah. anybody, right? Like we didn't know anybody. Can you can imagine if you had, you know, a daughter and she has a, your first grandbaby and she's learning how to be a mom and you drop her off a thousand miles away, you don't know anybody, right? Like super, super, super difficult. And, uh, you know, like it was crazy. I, I didn't know if I was going to get a scholarship, obviously. You know, I'm with the Grams and, and, you know, John Lucas comes and anyway, I ended up getting a scholarship and, and the last thing I wanted to do was go and sit on the bench at Oklahoma State, right? Like I didn't want to, you know, leave some place that was secure to go someplace and then basically just sit on the bench the entire time. And for, you know, and, um, I remember we were playing the first, um, we were playing the first little scrimmage that we were playing against, you know, the UA All-Stars or whatever it was, it was, and uh, we still didn't know who was going to start. We come back in and coach has like the starting lineup of the other team. And then he starts writing in the names of, of the guys of the, the defensive assignment. And my name was up there, guard the two guard. And it was kind of like this crazy, you know, I still, you know, think about it to this day where it was like, wow, you know, I really, I really worked hard for something that was, that wasn't given to me. Right. That was hard to, that was really, really difficult. Yeah. And I went out and played pretty well the first couple of games and kind of solidified my start as a, you know, my, my position as a starter. And I remember when we were going to the final four, you know, this is kind of jumping ahead. I realized, and we beat, you know, we beat St. Joe's kind of in dramatic fashion and, and uh, Natalie comes barreling out of the stands, you know, <laughs> and, and we're out in East Rutherford, New Jersey. And she jumps over the top of the railing, and this gigantic bear hug. And she's like, thanks for bringing me out to Oklahoma, even though at first I didn't want to come. Right. And to me, that was like, that was validating for me yeah because she hated me for a year. Like, no joke. Like, we laugh about it now, but, like, then she hated me. Yeah, I didn't make that year easy for him. I mean, I'm, I'm working at a gas station. You know, I'm, I'm going to school. I'm playing basketball. Like, it was really, really hard for us, you know. And then, 
And then the LDS, the Mormon you know, community really yeah. wrapped their arms around us. So between them and the school and the team, like it's a, that's why it's like, you know, and I quite frankly, I told my son, I was like, listen, Stillwater to us in Oklahoma State, it's a sacred place to us. So don't screw it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because for us, like it's a it, I'm letting you into a very sacred part of my life um, and the people and the experiences mm-hmm. that are there. And so um, it ended up being a really good experience for us, even though it was even though it was hard. So the best. It was the best. Well, before you even get to the point of that. Yeah, before when before you even get to the point of that season where you're you're starting, you're playing, and obviously we know what comes of that season. Was there a moment, and maybe Natalie, you can answer this, that you all sort of realized we've made the right dec- decision, even if it was hard to you know have enough money to eat, and how are you going to buy diapers for Jackson? And I mean, all those things that I'm sure a young family thinks about. Was there a point when you both thought, "All right, we did this. We made the right call moving to Oklahoma from Utah." I mean, honestly, it was, <laughs> once we committed to it, we were committed to it, right? Like, it wasn't like, yeah. all right, I'm out of here. And a lot of things <laughs> happened. Like, I think the first or second day that I got there, <laughs> I tried to, like, set up the washer, the washing machine, and the thing popped off and flooded our apartment. The drain on the back, yeah. And so I did it again. It flooded it two times he didn't have a cell phone so i ended up i'd forgotten this but he reminded me i ended up calling the basketball office and i was like i need to talk to daniel (laughs) and so they found him and they were like hey bro it sounds like you need to go home (laughs) and again i just like flopped myself on the bed and cried and i'm really not a crier you can't tell now. I don't know why I'm so emotional about this, but you know, even then with all of that and yeah, there was a time we had $55 in our bank account. (laughs) I will never forget that. And it just, but like we were committed and it was so hard, but literally the best thing that ever happened for the two of us. And I made his life really difficult that first year while I was adjusting and figuring things out but then the longer we were there and the more involved we became in everything then it just like all right we're doing this right so the first year was difficult we were still committed and then it was just after that first year and like he started playing and all of that it was just like we're jumping in with everything, right? And I'll never forget when he was redshirting or, yeah, had to sit out that year. They played. It was when I think OU came. And I'll never forget the noise level in that arena. And I had chills. And I looked down at him sitting on the bench. And he looked at me and both of our eyes were just this wide. Because we had never heard anything like that. You know what I mean? Ever. And it was just like, yeah, okay, this is going to be fun. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I don't feel like we were ever like well, halfway and- in, although that first year was real difficult. But after that, I was like, I don't care if I ever go back to Utah. <laughs> awesome you know so it was great well and I think about I think about the team that then was assembled in that uh, 2003-2004 I mean you referenced it a little bit ago Daniel just the guys that were coming in John Lucas Tony Allen the Grams you I mean I have to think that there was a point Maybe even before the world took notice of and those those decibel levels came that 2003 four season all the time before the world knew how good you guys were. Wasn't there a point in practice where you're like, oh, my gosh, this team's got a chance to be something really special? Yeah, we we, we did. I mean, that um, I think that's one of the reasons why we were so good, because, you know, the Grams, Joey and Stevie and myself, essentially, and we threw a couple other guys in there essentially that was our, that was our year. Right. And so like we worked really, really hard at it and 
you know, every day in practice, I would go to guard Tony Allen. It's like, hey, the knock on me was, hey, he can come in, he can knock down shots, but he can he defend, right? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to show you that I can defend, and I'm going to play against a guy that's obviously really, really good and very talented and quick and strong, and those are the types of guys I have to be able to stay in front of. And Tony got sick and tired of me guarding him every day, but I didn't care because it was like, I'm here to get better, you know? And and we would go in, and I remember they had, like, Melvin Sanders and Vic and – you know, um, you know, and, and Tony was on the other team and, and um, they had a, some, they had a really good team, but every day we would just go and we'd beat these guys up and we get beat up plenty. Right. But we'd give out, we'd give it to them just as much as they give it to us, you know? And, and so I think that, you know, John Lucas didn't come until after the whole Baylor accident and that, you know, the season had already started and he was a really good ad and it kind of took us some time to figure that out. But, you know, here's a really good example is Joey and I, they went, there's one scholarship for the three of us. So we had Grams, twins, and myself, and they gave one scholarship to, to the Grams because there was two of them that were that were coming. And and uh, Joey and I were working, uh, you know, at the gas station at what's on cue now, but it was Conoco Phillips, and we were working out there, and we were driving a truck, and you know, we get up at early in the morning at six a.m. We'd be at Gallagher, we lifting, and then we go work all day long together, and then we come home, and then we go over to Stillwater High School where it was, you know, three thousand degrees in that small little gym because it had been sweat box the entire day, and like we go work out with the team and stuff. And it was a ton of like, and that like we did hard things together, right? Like we became super close to one another because we were both sacrificing for something that we wanted most and we were willing to put in the work for it. And so even then we knew that we had a really good core, how that was all going to work and who was going to be, I mean, I was probably going to play point until John Lucas came into, into play right after the season or after school year had already started in that 2003, 2004 and we kind of, you know, and he's a great guy. And obviously we figured out a way to, to make that work. But we just felt like, you know, we had we had spent an entire year together basically playing defense the entire time. <laughs> and we just, we, we, we loved one another. Like we really formed a close relationship with each other. And it was because we went through hard things. I mean, if you can look back, Jenny, in your life and each person can look back in their life and say, you know, the things, the times that they've gone through, like the hardest things in their lives and the people they're able to come closest to those people that they've done the hard things with, you know, and as a 21, 22 year old kid, you know, with us kind of both in the same situation, like, Hey, we, we're all in, we're two feet in the circle and we're all in on this deal. And, and there's no place else for us to go. Right. Like we've got to figure out a way to make it work here at Oklahoma state. And so, you know, we got to go get a job. We got to be there early in the morning. We got to, it doesn't matter. We're going to go do that. You know? So. Yeah. Well, and I think about how different the scenario might've been today. I mean, the scenario wouldn't have happened today because transfers, obviously you'd have come in and played right away or, whatever. I mean, the scenario looks entirely different under today's situation. So even that comes to mind that how thing, how the, how the tiles had to set up and then it worked perfectly for you guys in 0304. It, it did. I mean, I don't think that it would work in this, in this kind of scenario right now because, um, because it's too easy, yeah. right? It's too, it's too easy just to leave and to say when things get, when things get tough, you decide that they're going to go someplace else. And quite honestly, I personally think you know, and Coach Sutton was so good at this. I mean, he was trying to help us become good people. And I think one of the things that, you know, that that experience, obviously, as we look back at it now, we have fondness. Imagine if we just decided, oh, well, it got too hard and we decided to go someplace else. You know what I mean? And we decided to run away from the heart. That it, we wouldn't have these same feelings that we have now, or these same memories or fondness of, of the times that we had when it was really hard, you know, and, you know, she's cooking a spaghetti pie and i think that you know it falls half it falls on the ground and we figure out a way to scoop it off the ground and throw it in the plate and still eat it because it's like we can't afford to let this thing just go to waste you know what i mean and it was just oh. the way, it's just the way it was you know what i mean and 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 honestly yeah. you know um we try to give that to our kids because it's it's you're right it's really really hard because kids want things people want things without having to pay the price for them and and um and everything in this world has its price. And we, we paid that price as a team. And I think that's what brought us really close together as, as a, as a team. And I love those guys. I honestly, I'm excited to see them. You know, we're having a little reunion this next month and I'm super excited to go see them. Uh, hopefully that all, hope, hopefully all of them show up or the majority of them show up. Cause there's some of them that I haven't seen for a while, wow. but um, I love those guys. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think about just that you guys get off to a 10 and one start in non-conference, which I hate to bring this up, but I know. you know, the only loss in non-conference, of course, BYU. Yeah. I missed a <sighs> shot to win the game. I don't know. What a downer. That. How did that happen? Good. Coach looked at me. I, I ha- don't. I had, I had the, I had the game of my life. I actually, that was probably the best all around game that I had played at Oklahoma state. I, 
I think I had 18, eight and eight, you know, and I missed and we had the ball and we ran. I still remember the play. It's Hoosier. It was a triple screen along the baseline on well, in, in, in timeout. He's like, you're going to win us the game. And I was like, you're right. I'm going to win us the game. Get me a shot. And he's like, okay, we're going to run Hoosier along the baseline. Joey Graham and Ivan McFarland, like just bury whoever was guarding me into the fifth row. And John Lucas <laughs> passes me the ball and I get it right in front of our bench and I get it at the NBA three point line. I kind of, I should have stopped at the, at the college. And so I caught it a little further out and I turn around and I'm wide open and I shoot it and it just barely hits the inside of the rim and bounces out. They get the rebound. We foul, they go make two free throws and it was game. And of course, everybody's going bananas, right? Because it was like, you know, they were laughing at me and all that kind of stuff. And that's a whole nother story for another day. But like coach Sutton, it was interesting. Danny Ainge was at that game. Cause I think they played the next night in, or in, in Salt Lake because the game was played at the Delta Center, which is where the Jazz play. And he walked me down the aisle you know, into the yep. into the into the locker room, and he was he had his arm around me, and he's just like, you know what, I was really proud of you, son. He's like, you played really well. He's in fact, you were the best player on the court tonight, and that was kind of cool for me because I mean, there's a, there was I don't know BYU wow. had a lottery pick, and Tony Allen was right there, and Joey Graham. I mean, there were three lottery picks probably on that floor that night, and and you know and. um it was a really good experience for me, but yeah, it was frustrating. We just cracked the top 25 and we lose to my old team and I missed a shot to win the game. That was kind of a bummer, but um, that's when the helmets and shoulder pads came out. I don't know if you remember that story, but like coach Sutton, we fly back home. Yes, I do. Yeah. We fly back <laughs> home and coach Sutton's, you know, well, so take a step back coach in the, in the locker room. He said, he looked at everybody. He's like, every one of you guys owe Daniel an apology. He's like, I've never seen anybody with as much pressure to perform. Right play as well as he did because a lot of times you get into a situation and you overpress. He's like, he's got his family in the, in the stands. He's got his parents. He's got his old school. That's like sitting there booing the heck out of him the entire time. He's like, you guys let him down, yeah. tonight, you know, because we got out rebounded. We got beat up essentially. And coach is like, that's not happening again. So we, so we get home at like two o'clock in the morning and coach is like, Hey, it's Sunday. Have a great Sabbath. Go to church Monday. Go get outfitted for helmets and shoulder pads. We'll see you guys at two o'clock in the afternoon. And he just walked off the bus, nice and calm, didn't say anything else. We all looked at each other like, did he just say what I thought he said? And, you know, we have to go into the office. Coach had a rule. We don't get to go in the office and say hello to him before the seat, before the practice started. So we go up there and, you know, did you get your shoulder pads? Did your helmet? Like, I thought you were joking. Yeah, I wasn't joking. You know, waiting for you down. They're waiting for you in the football locker room. Go. Like, all right. So we go there and we get there. We got the big tape across our forehead, you know, Bobic right on my, on my helmet. And, and he beat the crap out of us for two straight days you know but like and it was terrible like honestly oh. back in the day they used to have press row right there where the 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 the, the, the big time seats are now yep they left it all up and they would play this game called yep. war it was four on four defensive rebounding and they throw the ball off the rim on purpose and the ball would go into the stands and you had every guy that would jump <laughs> over the stands with their helmets and shoulder pads on trying to get the ball because the loser had to run with all that stuff on, right? And like it wasn't like, oh, it's okay. No, it's like, hey, you want to run? I'll run you. Oh. Which had like a, you know, I'll run you to your ankle smoke. Well, he definitely ran, ran us to our ankle smoke that day, and so like everybody was going hard. And so honestly, I think from that time forward, we lost four games that year. We lost three more the rest of the season, you know. And we were, what Coach said, we were one tough hombres. I mean, we were super tough, and a part of it was because. Mm -hmm. He was hard on us, mm -hmm. and we accepted that. And but we knew that he loved us. And that wouldn't fly today. There's no way in the world that you'd be able to put helmets and shoulder pads on kids because they would probably file some kind of complaint or something would happen, right? And Jenny, I remember yeah. not only that, but we had to do like a charge drill. We took three charges. So we took a charge to get up, take one from the middle, take get up, take another one from the other side. Then they'd roll the ball out towards half court and you have to dive on the floor before the ball got to half court. Well, he'd have the biggest guys. I don't remember a guy Gosh. named Franz Stein, but Franz Stein was 7'2", like 290 pounds. That was like a rugby yep. player. So he's just like, if you don't hit these guys hard, you're going to run. So now all of a sudden, here I am, I don't know, 200, 205. And he just, he plows me over and I go right into the back, into the back, into the standard. And I just get, get off and they're yelling at you and you get up and you do it again. Oh, yeah. And then, but it's just, it's just one of those things where like, we were pretty, we were pretty dang tough. And like in any other time, like, hey, do I got to go out yeah. and shoulder pads? We're like, no, coach. Yeah, we get it. No, yeah, uh -uh. Like, we'll play hard type of a deal, you know? And I honestly don't think that other teams were tougher than us, you know, from then on out. And it was awesome. Yeah. Like, again, it was hard going I, through it. I, I anything think that's worth anything is worth paying the price for it. You know what I mean? 
And nobody was like, oh, I'm going to transfer and I'm leaving this place. It's like, no, man, like we're going to go figure out a way to like fight through this because losing sucks. It's no fun. So anyway. Well, you mentioned only only three other losses, two in conference and then obviously the the final four loss. But those two in conference, I mean, they were they really were few and far between. I remember when you guys went to Texas and won and I thought this team has got great potential. I I thought it looked like a final four team, but you guys were on the inside of this machine. You saw it happening internally. When did you both realize that you know, that the, the decibels at Gallagher were something different, that this had become a happening. Like when, when Oklahoma State basketball played in the spring of 2004, people had to be there. When did you guys realize what was happening, just the momentum that was behind this team? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, we went and lost our first game, uh, first conference game in Tech, at Tech. So we went out there and played against those guys and we lost there. And then we just started winning. You know, I think the game that turned it was um, Kansas State. We played up at Kansas State. We won a really close game at the end. I think Tony hit a pretty tough basket, and we ended up winning at Kansas State. And I think we looked at each other, and we thought, we're pretty darn good. Like, we're not – like, we got to a point where we walked into every single game, and we expected to win every single game. It wasn't like, yeah, these guys are good. Yeah, who cares? Like, so are we. You know what I mean? Like, yes, we need to take care of this and do this and this and this, and we need to execute. There's no question, but there's nobody that's better than us. And I think that after probably that Kansas State game, and I don't remember – it was pretty early on in the Big 12, um, in the Big 12 conference, but we went to Manhattan and we beat them there. And, you know, to win on the road, you know, is tough, you know, and we then we smacked, um, you know, Kansas by 20 at, uh, at uh, you know, Bill Self, I think first, I think first time back in Gallagher up at Kansas. And we, and we put a smack down on those guys. And I think that they were supposed to be a pretty good team. And we looked at each other and said, hey, we can play with anybody. You know, so I think those are probably the two games, winning on the road at Kansas State and then and then beating, you know, beating Kansas handily at home. Um, I think we all kind of looked at one another and said we, we can win. In fact, we thought we were going to win. We, the other game we lost was on tr- a double overtime up at uh, on Columbia in Missouri. You know, winning at Iowa State was another one. When we went up to yeah. Iowa State and coach was like, hey, this is a really tough place to play. These guys are really good. They had a really good team. We went up there and beat them. And we looked around and said, well, they were good, but not that good. You know, and so um, I think, you know, Kansas yeah. State – beating Kansas at home, going up to Iowa State and winning, I think, you know, set the table for us to be like, we can play with anybody. And then going up to Missouri and losing in double overtime and not even playing that well, I think that we looked at one another and said we should win every single game. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Natalie, uh, we need to talk about cool chicks for a sec because yeah. <laughs> when I think about the the train that got rolling behind Oklahoma State basketball, you and your sister Christy were a huge part of the phenomenon, the the fabric of that year. Oh. What, take me inside that. P- cool oh, chicks God. wear orange. If people were watching in 04, even if they weren't, they probably have seen pictures of you guys. So how did that all take off? Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Holy cow. I don't even honestly remember. My high school team was orange and blue. And I was a cheerleader. So we had a shirt that said cool chicks wear orange. But nobody on my cheer squad liked it. Like, we hardly ever wore it because for some reason it, like, embarrassed them or something. I don't know what the reasoning was or even how that came to be. But then it just, like, I don't even remember. I'm sure my sister and I were just like, hey, what about, you know? And so we we went to Debris and Chad made one up for me with the vinyl letters. And, like, we found a cute striped shirt and did the whole thing. And so we just had one made for my sister and I. And then I think that was just right before the NCAA run or something like that. Big 12 12 tournament. Yeah, but anyway, we just had one made. And then (laughs) I remember coming back to Stillwater and, like, somebody was selling them in the stores. And I was like... Hold on. This was our idea. If anyone, that's my idea. idea. We're making some money. (laughs) And everyone was super cool. Like the store owners got it. They were awesome. I mean, I think they still sold some, but maybe gave us a 10% royalty or something. I don't even remember, honestly. 
But like we ended up trademarking it. I ended up going to Dallas markets after the fact and like doing a booth and selling them to different places. And it just ended up being like the most fun, crazy thing ever. And I remember one time in the, we were down in Oklahoma City for a game and I just had this huge duffel bag, an orange duffel bag full of shirts, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure this isn't legal. <laughs> <laughs> I had this huge double back full of shirts and literally got to our seats. This rush of people just swarmed us. And so me and my sister are just like doing this with shirts, right? And like they're gone within like five minutes. I have a stack of bills in my hand. I think it was like over $5,000 or something. And I look at it. And my dad was there, and he's six five and big. And I was like, "Here, dad, hold this." <laughs> you know? And I just like people just let things slide, and it was just like, I mean, I think I almost had more fun than Daniel did because I actually got to interact with the people in the crowd, and like you know, everyone was talking to me about stuff, and it just, it just was the best, most fun thing ever. Ever. <laughs> it still sort of amazes me. And I don't know, Daniel, if you guys as players sensed it, but like obviously Natalie and Christy were, a, you know, they were part of the whole phenomena, but then like just the crowds and everything, it just really felt like every time you guys played, it was a, it was a happening. Like the people had to be there. Did you guys as players have the sense of just how people had really taken to this team and this season? We, you know, we did. I mean, I think that the biggest thing was that you walk out there and the place was chuck full or we go out there, you know, we do our scouting report the night before and coach always got us a Brahm shake and we'd be out there drinking our shakes and then we'd have to go to the hotel the night before. And as we go out, there's tents all over the place well, and kids not? out there having fun. And, you know, we go take them pizza and we go play catch with them or do different things with the kids and the students that were out there you know, camping and lining up, you know, to go into the game, you know, go into the games or we'd get there early and we'd have to go through the crowd of kids to, in order to get to the front door at Gallagher and all the kids are giving us high fives and, and wanting to spend time with them and stuff. And, or you go on campus and, and, you know, kids are talking to you about the game or, you know, giving you, you know, high fives or just saying, Hey, good game or good shot or good, what just having conversations with you. So I think that to us was the exciting piece and this exciting part was for us to walk into a gym into Gallagher and to have, you know, the place be totally packed to have people um, that would were supportive to, with you off the court um, and wanting to be around you and things like that. I think that we kind of realized that there was something that it was something that was bigger than ourselves, right? That we were representing somebody bigger than ourselves. And quite honestly, as I look back at it now and I, and, and I probably couldn't articulate it back then, but now I've, I realized that we were bringing joy to other people's lives. You know, I think that, you know, people remember when John Lucas at the shot and we're going to the final four and they were, oh, I remember I was at my dad's house and we were jumping up and down yelling at this, you know, that TV, <laughs> you know, or oh, I was at Eskimo Joe's or I was here. Like people remember yeah. that are true Oklahoma State fans remember where they were when, you know, we kind of in dramatic fa fashion end up at going to the final four. And you start realizing like this was just more than just us playing basketball. Like this was us bringing a lot of joy to, you know, Oklahoma State fans. You know what I mean? And, and you know, Oklahoma State's kind of like the little brother of Oklahoma, you know what I mean? I mean, obviously they, we don't like to be called that. And, and people, you know, OU's got a lot of publicity and done really well over the years and things like that. But I feel like Oklahoma State's, you know, just speaking specifically to Oklahoma State fans, I feel like we're a really tight knit community and a family. And, and I mean, heck, we're sending our kid there, you know what I mean? He lives in Arizona, you know? And so there's a lot of people that are probably like that, that feel like, Hey, listen, it's such a, it's a special place, really amazing people. And honestly, I think that they understand good basketball. I think that they've gotten, you know, Coach Sutton being there, I think, you know, helped. They just understand what good basketball is like. They appreciate effort. Okies to us are very humble people in a really good way, right? And I think that um, and it's reflected in the way that they play, but that we played basketball. I think that they connected with us as players because a lot of us had gone to the places and they knew that yeah. we were just going to play really hard, right? Like that we were going to play team defense, that we were going to make all the plays that quite honestly win games. And the people understood that and they appreciated that. And I think that that's, you know, none of us were five-star recruits, right? Coming out of high school, you know, you have all these 
rankings yeah. where everybody wants to get the best, you know, the best talent. And I think that there's a there's there's a there's a portion a portion of that. But I think that also, you know, the best teams are the ones that you know have guys that can buy in. And um, and Oklahoma State fans, I think, recognize that and appreciate that an awful lot. And that's what they I think they saw and appreciated in us. Yeah. So. In fact, there's still you a mentioned quote. the uh, dramatic shot that John Lucas. Oh, oh, so you can probably see even behind here, right? Oh, so like, go I remember ahead, go ahead. Practice. It says a jackass has never won the Kentucky Derby, and that's from Coach. That's from Coach Sutton said that one time in practice. Okay, and he stopped us in practice one time. I was like, "Hey, a jackass has never won the Kentucky Derby." I'm like, what? What is that? He's like, "Yeah, know what the Kentucky Derby is, isn't you? Don't you?" And I said, "Coach, it's not a horse race." <laughs> and he said, "Yeah." He's like, "You never see like a donkey running down that thing. You'll never win that." He's like. <laughs> We need for you guys to be more thoroughbreds and less jackasses. You know what I mean? And and I think that for me, like, you know, you know, that doesn't mean you have to be a five-star recruit, but I think that you have to like buy into what it takes. You know what I mean? The small, simple things that help win yeah. games. I mean, you look at any sporting event, the game comes down to like a handful of plays on either side. And that's the difference between winning and losing. And I think that, you know, that's one of the lessons that coach taught us maybe through the helmets and shoulder pads or the way that he had his practices was, Hey, you know what? You got to make some of those tough plays in order to, in order to win. And you do that and people will love you for it. You know what I mean? And I think people loved us because we, they felt like we played the right way. We played super hard. We played, we respected the game and coach Sutton a lot of times would just be like, Hey, listen, yeah. you know, you, you owe everybody an apology for the way that you guys played tonight. He's like, you didn't play hard. You didn't play with energy mm -hmm. or passion and stuff. And we kind of thought about that. Like, well, you know, these people are spending their hard earned money or they're coming from an hour, hour and a half away, two hours, whatever it is to come and watch us. And it's snowing outside. Oh like God. we deserve it. You know, we owe it to them. They deserve our best efforts. Right. And so I felt like he instilled that in us is that this is a this is a family and it's just not you, but you represent everybody else that's out there. And to me, that's that's what's special. That's why, you know, I wear Oklahoma State gear and I can't put I can't put a BYU thing on because <laughs> even though I got a daughter that's there and I was I know and I went to school there because. Oklahoma State and the people that were there, that's that's us, you know? Well, so you guys were so unselfish. Yeah. Yeah. So unselfish as a team. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off on well, something that you were gonna Well and I think about the No, 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 please cut me off because this is all awesome stuff. I mean, I think people like to hear those behind the scenes stories because what they saw was stuff like you guys beating a really tough pit team in the regional semifinals. Yeah. And then you beat a really tough St. Joe's team in the regional finals. You talk about playing hard. You guys had to play really hard in those two games to win. And I know everybody likes to talk about John shot for good reason, but those were two games that to me watching that season play out. I'll, I really won't forget those two games for just because of just the challenge that those two teams presented you guys. For sure. And you got to remember, we're the two seed in the East, right? So now St. Joe's and Pittsburgh are like 60 miles from there, right? So basically it became yeah. like a home game for yeah. both those schools. So essentially we beat Pitt and then Pitt fans are selling their tickets to St. Joe's <laughs> fans because they're like, well, I'm leaving and I'm going home. And, you know, Philly is, yes. you know, 50, 60 miles or whatever from there. And so they're, so it basically became kind of like, you know, us versus the world. And, and honestly, I, I think that we, we liked that because, we were super tight. We were super tight with one another. And, it, you know, it, here's the part that's hard. You know, everybody wants to be a star, right? Like everybody wants to score a bunch of points and everybody wants to, you know, play. every one of us wanted to play in the NBA, right? I mean, we all went there because we had aspirations to, to improve sure. as basketball players and play in the NBA. I think I'm like the only guy that's starting team that didn't play in the NBA. I went over to Europe, played in Germany. But I think that coach, what he did was every one of us played a role. Right. And and it was like, Daniel, you're our best perimeter defender and you can, you know, knock down open shots and you're a really good passer. So don't turn the ball over, play really good defense, knock down open shots and you're going to play. And that's how you can add value to our team. And everybody was a little bit different. And honestly, after that BYU game, John Lucas was kind of like a fish out of water. Right. I mean, he had just gotten on campus. You know, he was used to scoring off a lot of points at Baylor and it was kind of Tony and I were scoring a bunch of points and John was just kind of there. And I think that, you know, John's strength wasn't defense. It never has been defense. I mean, he's a five foot 10 or five foot 11 guy. He's kind of undersized. Right. And he was a small guy. And so you're playing really physical teams yeah. and it's like, hey, Daniel, you're six, five. Hey, Tony, you're six, four. You're a pretty strong, dude. You're going to go out and guard these, these, these strong physical guards. 
you know, we'll try to find a way to hide John. And that's not a knock or a slide on John because he had other roles and responsibilities on our team that really made us good, right? But I didn't want to play defense. I didn't want to like shoot it three times a game, right? Like that wasn't what I wanted to do. But I, but, yeah. but winning is fun, right? And I realized as I get older, even in my career with my family or anything like that, it's like everybody has a different role in, on teams. In order for people, for a team to do really well, everybody yeah. has to buy into the role. They have to know what their role is and they have to buy into it really, really well. And sometimes that's hard, especially because a lot of times it's not sexy or it's not what you want or what you think. You know, and I think that those two games in particular, as we went out to yeah. East Rutherford and we're playing basically two away games against two really, really physical, tough teams, um, that showed a lot about who we were. In fact, I still have a scar on my wrist from when I took I, I felt like I took a charge. I got pushed into the scores table and they had like the light, the white, the red light that went on top of the scores table. And it was like plastic and it like cut my wrist, kind of up my wrist and. And I just told him it was bleeding. And I just told him to put that like powder stuff that stung like crazy on it to get it to stop <laughs> bleeding and just go back in the game and just keep playing. You know what I mean? Cause like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to miss it. Right. And it was, it was just a ton of fun going into an arena where, um, you know, a lot of people probably had some doubts and stuff, but we had been in, we played in tough places and we just looked at one another and there was no doubt that we were, we, we weren't going to win. We just felt like we could play a lot of different styles. We could score yeah. a lot of points. Or we could actually, you know, play some defense and and lock guys down. And so um, those are really fun. In fact, I remember we beat Pittsburgh and we were trying to decide who was going to guard, you know, Jameer Nelson, who was obviously the college player of the year that year. And coach, you know, we only have one day, you know, in between. Right. And so coach, uh, coach, you know, gets ready for yeah. scouting report before he gives them out. He comes over to me and he's like, hey, man, we're going to stick you on Jameer. And I just, he's like, you know, I, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Use your length. And he kind of gave me some pointers and different things like that. And I was like, okay, I got this. You know what I mean? It was like, it wasn't like I was disappointed that I wasn't going to go out and get more shots. Cause I know what that meant. Essentially what that meant is Daniel, you're going to be out there just playing defense and trying to help slow him down because he's a really good player. Right. And I took that, I took that responsibility yeah. really, really serious mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to win and because yeah. I love my teammates. Right. So anyway, yeah. those were, those were a blast. And when we won that, that game, you know, I went to Heritage Hall this last week and or when we dropped Jackson off a couple of weeks ago and there's a kind of a cool picture that someone from the AP took and it's me and Joey, um, you know, after we won that and we both got our hands up, you know, in the air and it's kind of cool. And I guess I get, I haven't really thought of this, but Joey and I were the two that redshirted that year, but didn't have, didn't have scholarships and we worked really, really hard together. So we became, you know, we're the ones there at six o'clock in the morning, you know, lifting under, you know, Gallagher Iba at six o'clock in the morning and, and then going and working all day long and, and it wasn't easy. Yeah. It wasn't fun. But we became super close with one another. And I just remember, you know, just loving those guys an awful lot because um, we cared about one another, you know. And it was cool to see, like. Yeah. Well, and I. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it was just cool to see, like, uh, Tim Robbins came after the game. No, no. I was. <laughs> like, Tim Robbins was there after the game. And he was super yeah. excited. He lived in New York. Yeah. And his son Jack essentially picked us to win the NCAA tournament and so like they just came across the river and went to the game and they came afterwards and he he was like hey your wife is crazy like because he was sitting next to her and she was up there you know doing the dance and going crazy and stuff like that and he like walks in he's like, he looks at you it's at me and he gives me this hug and he gives he comes back and he's like your wife is crazy I like her you know and so like crazy stories we became good friends with Jack his son his son came to Oklahoma State camp the next summer and we ended up taking him out to Bad Brad's out, you know, barbecue joint out there. And we stayed in contact with them for a couple of years afterwards, because like, those are the types of, you know, relationships that we made with people while we were playing. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, uh, I hadn't thought as much about that shot. I went back and did a little reminding of myself and I mean, obviously it worked out great. It was a huge moment, still one of the you know biggest moments in NCAA tournament history, but the thing that I'd forgotten was you guys give up a basket to go behind, but then no timeout. So the sequence of you guys getting the shot, going back ahead, and then the defensive stand yep. all happens without a timeout. The coaching and the the trust in each other, I hadn't even thought about that since basically that happened in 2004. But man, doesn't that just speak to what you guys, how you guys played together, but also how the coaches prepared you for that moment? A hundred percent. I mean, we, 
it was loud and Joey and I, the sequence that you're talking about, the guy set up ball screen and Joey and I didn't communicate. I was supposed to fight over the top of the screen and I did. Joey and I didn't, you know, communicate and they hit a three. And so now all of a sudden we're down and yeah, we went up and, you know, we didn't have a timeout and, and uh, we were trying to run a play and obviously it was kind of a broken play and Joey tries to, you know, makes a, makes a move to the basket and slips and John hits a great shot. Now the hard part and what a lot of people don't understand is now Jim Nelson has the basketball with seven seconds to go, and they decided not to t- call a timeout because they didn't want to give us a chance to set up our entire defense, right? And so we they knew that we'd probably throw something different at yeah. them or give us a chance to actually re- regroup. So now all of a sudden you're guarding, you're me, and now I'm guarding the best player in the country with seven seconds to go. He's super fast. He shoots 90% from the free throw line, and two thoughts went through my head. I was like, number one, he's not getting past me, and number two is I'm not fouling him. Because I, you know, we already going. We, they were in the bonus, and so I thought to myself, "All right, as I'm backpedaling. I'm thinking, keep him in front, don't foul." And so he makes a quick little move, and I stay in front of him, and I'm yeah. like, "This, you know," and you know, he makes a tough, sh- you know, he makes another play, and I stay with him, and I make him take a really, really tough shot, and and I turn around and think that ball better be short because I played what I thought was really good defense against <laughs> him, and and you know, well, it was short, and we get the rebound, and. In place, we go bananas, and that's when Natalie gives me her gigantic bear hug and says, thanks for bringing me out to Oklahoma. Spider the, monkey. That's right. <laughs> right. And, and, and this is actually a legit. Yeah. This, was this is the purchased. original. And, we st- I mean, we still have fond memories of Well, that I I feel like we've got. We've gotten all this way and we haven't even talked about really the final four yet. All the lead up was obviously the best parts, but. All the fans that were against you guys in East Rutherford, they were suddenly for you in the Alamo Dome. There was orange everywhere in San Antonio. That had to be, I just can't imagine. what what You just had to feel like, all right, this is going to be fantastic. It, it was awesome. I think the biggest thing for me is like, I remember my name was the last one called. And I remember um, because we were, the, we were the higher seed. And so we were the two seed and they were the three. And so we were the home team. And, you know, Tony Allen or John Lucas was always kind of the last one called, but for whatever reason, you know, they called Tony and then I'm sitting there by myself as they call the last person. And I'm thinking to myself and I kind of look up and I actually got a picture of it. One of the guys I have a picture and I'm kind of sitting there and I'm looking down and I'm trying to, quite frankly, I'm trying to keep my emotions in check because I'm thinking to myself, here's this kid two years ago that was, you know, sitting on the bench at BYU who made a huge bet on himself you know, and put his family in a, in a tough spot. Yeah. And then here I am starting in the final four and set up in front of 55, 60,000 people. You know what I mean? Like, and, 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 and take it a step further, yeah. I guess for me, you know, I, I kind of pride myself. I'm from Newbury Park, California, which is a small part of like Thousand Oaks. And I was always like, Hey, I'm not from Thousand Oaks. I'm from Newbury Park, California. And for me, it was representing all the people that were kind of back home. And for them to say, Hey, you know, a six, five guard from Newbury Park, California, Daniel Bobbick, and it was just felt like there were a lot of people that were um, cheering me on. You know what I mean? That meant an awful lot. It meant an awful lot to me. And so, you know, to lose the game obviously stunk, and it was it was it was tough because you know you get your heart ripped out because you know honestly we ripped out St. Joe's heart the week before that, and then we get our heart ripped out, and that's part of what makes the NCAA yeah. tournament as great as it is, is because it, those dramatic moments that are like that. Um, but I just. I just love um, – I just remember thinking I really love this place. I love these people. And I love Coach Sutton. I'm, real, I'm grateful for Coach Sutton. For Always will be grateful for him for taking a chance on me and for giving me a shot because I remember, yeah. you know, after the year we redshirted and we all start ready to start the season and he's like, listen, brings everybody together. And he's like, listen, I have a ton of talent here, probably the most I've ever had as a, as a whole. Um, he's like, I don't care if you redshirted last year, if you were on scholarship, if you were an all American, if you were a Juco kid, like, I don't care what your deal was. He's like, I'm going to pay the, I'm going to play the best players and it all starts. It all starts right now. And I felt like, you know, he gave me a shot. Yeah. Was I the most athletic guy? I absolutely wasn't the most athletic guy. Was I the best, you know, and a lot of other things I wasn't, but you know, I got an awesome text from Sean about a year ago and he's like, you know, and I wish I. I got a new phone and it erased my some of my text messages and I wish I would have saved it. But Sean was just like, listen, I know that that John and, and Joey and, and Tony get a lot of the credit, you know, for, for that for that final four run. But he's like, 
people that understand the game of basketball know that there's no way in the world that we would have made it to the final four without you. And that meant a lot to me. That wasn't like a huge, you know, Oh, look at me and I'm great. But like for people to understand, like to realize that you played an important role on a team that exceeded expectations. I mean, nobody expected us. I don't even know what we were picked. We probably picked to be sixth or seventh. You probably know better than I, but nobody expected us to be. We were just a bunch of misfit kids that had no real returning experience. You had Tony Allen as returning starter and Ivan McFarland and everybody else was just a bunch of guys that were second chance kids. You know what I mean? And and I think for us to really come together and and yeah. to do what we did, it was it was special. And I'll always be grateful for Coach Sutton, who gave me a shot. Um, to really bet on myself. And I, I remember it might've been Barry Trammell or someone after we lost to Syracuse the year before and, and um, you know, and Carmelo Anthony and stuff in my red shirt year, there was a little article that said, you know, here's what to kind of expect for next year. And it was like Daniel Bobbick, he's a sharp shooting guy. He's going to come in and knock down some shots and we'll, you know, play, you know, a handful of minutes. And I pinned, pinned that sucker up to my bulletin board and was like, Oh yeah, I don't know who this Barry Trammell guy is, but I'm going to show this guy. You know, that's not happening, right? Like that's not that's not the way this is going down, you know? And and it was really cool that I got that opportunity to be able to do that. So I'm really grateful for Coach that he gave me that shot to 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 be a part of something bigger than myself and be special, you know? <laughs> and I love Barry Trammell, by the way. There's so much about that year that I know Stan Right. I wonder what happened to that guy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's obviously so many memories that stand out for you guys, so many heartstrings. But before we, before I let you go, I feel like I need to just, Natalie, let's start with you. Just as you think back on that, that season 20 years ago now, oh. is there just a, a feeling, an emotion, something that really sticks with you even now? Here we are 20 years later. Honestly, just love. <laughs> I loved every single second of it all of it I loved yeah you know Daniel would puke before the first practice of every year <laughs> all day because he knew it was coming yeah. and you know it just like I yeah. loved the people I loved the coaches I loved his teammates I loved the teammates families I got to know all of them I loved every experience we were able to go to I love the time with my sister and my mom. She traveled out to almost every game. Like, just Jackson with his little animals as he's sitting in the, the seat. It's not Oklahoma State flag. Or his Oklahoma State flag, not giving a crap what was going on. Like, I just, I loved every <laughs> second of it. I loved every second of it. It was just mm. the best, hardest, most fun time of our life. For sure. It's still like every Final Four or NCAA tournament, really, we're just like, oh, like all the memories come rushing back. And it's just, it's, I'm so thankful that we had that time. And I'm so thankful we, I got to do it with him. Yeah. Like we were together. Absolutely. Because that would have really stunk if I just married him afterwards yeah. and got to hear about it, right? Like, I was part of it, and it was like the best, just yeah. the best time ever. It was. It was. Daniel, what about for you? What stands out for you? Emotion, thought. I mean, like like I said, I know there's so much, but sure. is there sort of a a feeling that stands out now all these years later? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is uh. I think the biggest thing is gratitude, right? I'm just really, really grateful. Um, I'm grateful for my coaches. I'm grateful for my teammates. I'm grateful for the people. I mean, Harry Birdwell was the AD there, and I got to know Harry really well, and Joe Mueller and some of these other guys. Like, you know, these guys were really, really good to me. I'm grateful for a guy like Rusty Shaw that gave me a job working at his at his gas station when I, you know, couldn't have didn't have any money or food to, you know, to feed my kids, you know, you know, to feed my son and. Um, I'm just really grateful that, um, for that place, for, like I said, for, for everything, for how hard it was grateful for coach for giving me a chance. I'm grateful for my teammates that, you know, accepted me as a, as a player. I mean, obviously I was way different than I'm right. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm the only guy married and the only guy with a kid and they had no idea what I was going through. And now some of them are dads. Right. And they're all like, wow, you know, this kind of dad thing is cool. And I said, yeah, 
you know, I was experiencing that as a 22 year old here. I mean, while I was your teammate, you know, and, and so I'm just grateful that I was able to share it with so many people. Um, and that it brought a lot of joy in other people's lives because, um, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was a special place and a special time. And I'm grateful that we, I'm, honestly, I'm grateful that we made it to the final four. I mean, the sweet 16 is nice and the lead eight is nice. And, and, you know, a national championship would have been, would have been great. Of course. Um, I am just, you know, making it kind of to that, that final four kind of puts you in a, you know, puts that team and that memory kind of in a, in a, in a different, you know, in a different tier or category, you know what I mean? That it's like, it's kind of a, it's kind of a special, yeah. it's kind of a special um, fraternity for lack of a better term to be with, you know what I mean? And so I'm just, um, I'm just really grateful that, that even now that it still means as much to us as it does, I'm grateful that she had fun with this whole thing, <laughs> that it wasn't like, it was just me and she was just sitting there like this the entire time and hating it that she was a part of it. I, I'm, and I think, you know, it, you know, people like yourself, right? I mean, a lot of the reporters and a lot of the people that were there wrapped their arms around my family and, and made us feel special and, and, and really welcomed us into that Oklahoma family. And so we're really, I think that's probably the if one adjective that I could use to describe it is just gratitude for, for the whole experience, you know. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it because we'd obviously well, this is talk about it much. You know what I mean? I mean, we don't talk about it a ton. I mean, I do have my Oklahoma State stuff and that I I still wear and, and and things like that. But I think that you know, if anybody that's listening to this, if they even make it to this part of the segment, because we've been talking so much, um, you know, we just hope that they know that we love them and that we're grateful for we're grateful for for them and for their their support of you know us is is a team and in the, in the university as a whole and the basketball team, because Oklahoma state is a special place. Well, we could keep talking all day. Literally I would, but I know that you all have a job to do and I promise to not keep you forever. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. You guys, this was outstanding out of sight. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks for the time. Big thanks to Daniel and Natalie, and thanks to all of you. If this was your first time hearing or watching The Jenny Carlson Show, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Also, download our new Sellout Crowd app for your iPhone or Android. Thanks again for being here, and we'll see you next time.